find so much in common in terms of history, language, culture, and geography, South Asia remains one of the most divided regions in the world. The quest to bring South Asia closer together remains an eternal one among the people of the region. The next session asks if the future can be the glue that binds us together. Our three speakers are C.K. Lal. C.K. Lal is Nepal's most prolific newspaper columnist, writing both in Nepali and English for more than 20 years now. A noted public intellectual, Lal is widely read for his critical analysis and sharp insight. He's also the author of a number of nonfiction books about identity and politics. Akshimukul is the author of many novels, include, including Gita Press and The Making of Hindu India, which won every major nonfiction award in India, including the Crossword Book Award, Ramnath Goenka Award, Tata Literature Live Award, Atta Galata Bangalore Literature Festival Prize, and the Shakti Bhatt Award. His latest, latest book is The Many Lives of Ageya, a biography of the modernist Indian writer Sachidananda Hirananda Watsayam. Our Booker Prize winning author, Shehan Karunatilaka, had a session yesterday where he talked about his writing journey. And if any of you missed it, I highly recommend watching the recording when it's available. Shehan has published two novels and three children's books, including China Man, The Legend of Pradeep Matthew, winner of the 2012 Commonwealth Book Prize, and The Seven Moons of Mali Olmeda, winner of the 2012 Booker Prize. Moderating the session will be Namrata Chaturvedi. Namrata Chaturvedi teaches in the Department of English, Zakir Hussain, Delhi College, University of Delhi. Her published books include Memory, Metaphor, and Mysticism in Kali Das's Abhigyanam Sakuntalam, God Online, Indian Spirituality in the Digital Space, and the Translation of Fatsum from Nepali into Hindi. Like I said before, the session is presented to us by Himalaya Airlines. So on the behalf of Himalaya Airlines, I'd like to call Ujwala Dari to come to the stage and give a token of remembrance to our speakers. First, we are going to start with Shehan Karnatilaka. Thank you once again to Ujola as well as Himalaya Airlines for presenting us this session. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, we have an hour to talk about literature from South Asia. Welcome to the second, edition, uh, second session of the day. And after a very engaging and focused uh, session on education, it is only befitting that we have a session on what comes out of education, writing writing and culture. So we are going to talk about literature, literatures from South Asia. We have a very, we have a very distinguished uh, panel uh, of speakers uh, with us here. Uh, three writers who've made a mark in non-fiction and fiction. And uh, we, I'm sure many of us are familiar, uh, we have been reading their works and we know the kind of impact that it has had not only on the literary, cultural and political traditions of the nations uh, where they are writing, but of the entire region of what we call as South Asia. So um, as we begin to talk about South Asia, uh, just, a quick, uh, just a quick reminder of how um, the, the session is called Can Literature Bring South Asia Together? Now, if you think about it, if we go back in time, we know for sure that South Asia has been together. How it has been together, we go back to ancient literature, we go back to the medieval times, and we know that we have shared histories. Uh, we have a cultural a continuum of spiritual traditions, of religious exegesis, of devotional writing, uh, of a very vibrant tradition of performance with the traveling of actors. This is a very unique feature of South Asian literature, South Asian territory, the cultural territory that South Asia is. We have been together for a very, very long time. Um, translations and adaptations. 
And a very, very important category that we often ignore is a oral knowledge tradition. So South Asia shares a very vibrant, a very, very mature uh, continuum of uh, oral traditions. And as uh, our, um, uh, as our compare for the day was pointing out in the, just before the session started, that we have unfortunately very fractured identities now. And that is the problem, and that's the problem that we are going to address today uh, by asking ourselves why we're not together anymore. So we begin uh, the session by a series of questions. I'm supposed to be asking questions. So uh, I begin by re, uh, what the first thing that came to my mind, uh, with the title of the panel was A.K. Ramanujan's essay. A.K. Ramanujan, a very uh, celebrated Indian poet, uh, he had written an essay that we often teach in our universities. It's called, Is There an Indian Way of Thinking? Now, with this statement, I want to ask, uh, I want to begin with Akshay, uh, to ask him, is there a South Asian way of thinking? Uh, yeah, is there, there is a South Asian way of thinking. And I'll, uh, what I'll do is I'll confine myself to, I'm mostly a person of non-fiction. I spend my daytime in dark and dingy archives. And most often I find uh, that the South Asian thing that we talk about, I was very excited about this panel also because I encounter uh, in my work, for instance, the last work that I did, uh, there was a lot of stuff that I needed, for instance, from archives in Pakistan. Now all of us know that it's next to impossible how to deal with it. And it's a, it's a problem now that only the Indian scholars are facing, but Pakistani scholars are facing. And we have just shut ourselves completely. Similarly, problem with, uh, if you want anything, which you were pointing out yesterday, uh, a Chinese scholar working on Buddhism had a problem coming to India, Indian scholars going to China. And I, I realized that many of this, I, I met a scholar uh, recently in US who works out of Taiwan for some reason, because he says he can't enter China and he has built some network. So that's how I feel one of the, I, in the non-fictional space that I work, I feel there is a lot that can be done. I myself, when I had to need, I needed something from Lahore archives or Islamabad archives, I had to build a kind of a own informal network and ensure that the footnote doesn't reflect that the material has come from uh, Islamabad archive because that could have put the gentleman in trouble, the friend who helped me out. So there is this huge, and it's, it's created a huge problem. Whereas in till 50s, 60s, or even recently, you know, we know, uh, till 2000, almost 10, 11, scholars were going. There were like long phases when, you know, India and Pakistan won't be talking to each other. So that is there. So there is a scope. There can be a great South Asian voice, which Ramanujan said, uh, but unfortunately it's not happening. Unfortunately, it's not happening, but maybe with India and Sri Lanka, Sehan can tell us, India, Nepal, yes, we have shared past, shared history, common history. So yes, that's what I think. It's possible, but it's kind of limited by the politics of our times. Yeah. CK Ju, just to continue this, is there a South Asian way of thinking? And what kind of a category would South Asian literature be? Is it a philosophical category? Is it a literary classification? Uh, or is there something more to it? Thank you, uh, Navrata. Yeah. That's no, an interesting it. question. First part of it is, you have to, we have to begin, is there a South Asia? Or it lies just in our imagination. And then the second part, is there a South Asian literature? When you deal with the first part of the question, South Asia is a kind of a geographical reality. This landmass that we know now as South Asia used to be a part of Gondwana landmass about 100 million years ago. And now if you say that Indian plate, especially Pakistani friends will take offense, but that is what the geological term, the South Asian plate broke away from Gondwana and pushed into Eurasian plate and we ended up with the Himalayas. So geographically, there is South Asia. Now, then from geography, you come to history. Is, is there uh, South Asia historically? Of course, there is. Buddha, 
a South Asian, though we like to say Buddha was born in Nepal, but uh, more of a South Asian because uh, uh, the religion is in Sri Lanka, in Burma, and uh, you know, in Afghanistan, uh, rocks, uh, Buddha existed, and of course in Pakistan, Tibet, of course. Uh, pa so uh, uh, that part, the history part, the culture part, that, is, that also South Asia exists. Then we come to politics. And whether we agree or not, this British Empire brought South Asia together in ways that has disintegrated during Mughal times for a, quite a long time. Uh, the British Empire gave us uh, this Western idea of democracy, not our idea of democracy. They gave us uh, English language. Even though countries like Bhutan and Nepal were never colonized, it was right on the circle of that colonization. So we cannot say that we are out of it. So politics also joins us together. What, ki what keeps us a bit separate, I think, is uh, probably uh, this uh, nationalism, this sense of nationalism. And that is emotion. That is the same with literature. Literature is mostly about emotions. So we find that uh, this, we are doing all our work in different languages, but uh, that South Asian sensibility is somewhat missing because of this great nationalism project of uh, uh, 19th and 20th century. The South, Asian re the South Asian sensibility is what uh, we are going to be talking about. What is the sensibility made of? And uh, uh, why the sens sensibility doesn't get translated and transferred from one South Asian national nationality to another? We'll be talking about this uh, further on. Now, uh, Shayan, um, I remember that even in your acceptance speech, you said that South Asia has been put on the map now. Sri Lanka is on the map of the literature of South Asia now, with the, with, with the, uh, with, you know, when, when we're talking about South Asia, we tend to talk more about India than the other South Asias that are in South Asia. It's a perpetual problem in academic departments. It's a perpetual problem in the publishing industry. It's a perpetual problem in awards. It's a perpetual problem everywhere. So. Uh, I re it's not a question, it's a request to Shehan to talk about the many South Asias in South Asia. The South Asias beyond India. And what are the literary exchanges, inspirations and dialogues that are going on, say, between Pakistan and Sri Lanka or Bangladesh and Nepal, or from your observations as a writer? Oh, that's a lot. That's a lot. Um, so, the South Asian sensibility, uh, South Asian way of thinking, um, I'm not sure how useful it is to uh, try and think of South Asia as a monolith because we were well aware that it isn't and that it's composed of multiple narratives and multiple stories. And, um, you know, they are obvious. Obviously, it's a geographical construction and we share our history and we share a lot of our conflicts as well. We have very similar conflicts, similar turmoil. Um, we all like to eat dal by hand. You know, that's something I think that binds us, uh, I've seen throughout the region. We, um, we've had similar bumbling government. And similar, I mean, the conflicts may be different in shape, but uh, some may be religion-based, some may be race-based, some may be class-based. But we've seen that, and we've seen this turmoil, and we've lived with that reality. But I mean, I don't know the question of putting South Asia on the map, because I think South Asian literature has been on the map for some time, and even Sri Lankan literature has been, we've had successes before. Um, what, and the question that preoccupied me all these years was, uh, is there a Sri Lankan way of thinking? Is there a Sri Lankan way of writing? And I think the, the tragedy that I feel with Sri Lanka, the many, there are many tragedies, but I guess with literature is, our literatures are in silos. So um, preparing for this session, I was exposed to my own profound ignorance of, I mean, I can tell you about Sri Lankan writing in English. Oh, there's a question time. coming about that later on. And um, yeah, and, but, when I looked at Sri Lankan writing in Sinhalese or Tamil, you know, I can, I can bring up names of, uh, you know, Martin Vikramasinghe, W.A. Silva, and so on. Books that are unread on my shelf, because, uh, you know, I can read Sinhala, I read the newspapers, follow the news, but I don't read Sinhala for pleasure, and that's my uh, shortcoming. And Tamil even worse. Um, 
there's this terrific writer Shob Shakti who we can talk about who's a child soldier in exile. And, um, but what I feel is each of these literatures have, have their own kind of award structure and their own readership. Even in the bookshop, they are put separately. And you can see the marked difference of the, you know, the celebrated uh, Sri Lanka writers in English, Gunasekara Undachi, Selva Durey, how they are displayed and how the Sinhala and the Tamil literatures are. And there's not a lot of reading, not a lot of translation between. And I feel that that is what is holding up. You can't talk about Sri Lankan literature because I don't think we are reading each other. And, uh, and so my hope has been that with this success that my books can be translated into Sinhala and Tamil. And it's, I'm still working on that and hopefully it'll introduce traffic in both directions. Um, but I think, so I think that's the project for Sri Lanka that sadly then, because I think it's not one way, one Sri Lankan sensibility or one South Asian sensibility. There are multiple narratives around every event. If you take the recent history of 2022, the Easter attacks or the era I was writing about, multiple narratives. And I think it's more useful that we read each other's stories uh, and understand the different perspectives instead of having the one narrative that's handed down to us by the media or the government or by the, our limited reading. So that's in Sri Lanka. Um, I mean, Maybe let's pass it around and we can talk about um, Sri, uh, Sri Lanka, like my relationship as a Sri Lankan writer and how I was influenced by the success of India and Pakistan and Bangladesh and so on. And perfect. That's what we're looking for. Uh, the, the question now that hangs before us is, why are we not reading each other? Why are we not reading each other enough? And what are the ways in which we can read each other uh, in more accessible ways? And this is a question that is for the entire panel actually to answer in their own ways. Why are we not reading each other and what can we do to read each other better? So I will, um, you know, I'll start with CK Lalju to, ask you, uh, to te ask you to tell us about the many literatures of Nepal. Oh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, when, it, uh, when you say South Asian literature, it becomes very complex. Which language, what kind of literature, what kind of feeling, emotion. Similarly, when you talk of Nepali literature, it's just, just not the question of what is being written in Nepali. When you talk of Nepali literature, uh, what kind of things are being written in different languages of Nepal, uh, Nepal Bhasa, So Nepali. let's tell our audience what are the different languages of Nepal. Yeah. And then with that, when there are many kinds of people, of course, basic emotions are all the same. We all love, we all fear. Uh, hunger is there. Basic emotions are all there. But then there are emotions uh, uh, that are specific to people. Uh, Akshay has written a wonderful book about Agye. And one of his quotes that I like uh, is, uh, you know, he said somewhere that uh, mountains are very patriarchal. The god is male. Similarly, the sea is also very frightening, so very patriarchal. The god is again a man. Even the desert is very fearful. The god is again male. But only when you come to river valleys, then, uh, you know, it's very feminine, it supports. So these locales give emotion to, uh, you know, river valleys have their matrikas, you worship goddesses. So these kind of emotions vary. So if you are in Pokhara, probably the literature will be different. But overall, uh, what Perhaps uh, when you have a generic Nepali literature kind of a thing, you have to begin probably for, uh, rishis who uh, wrote, uh, you know, Yagvalk Sutra in Mithila or, you know, you have to begin from there or Balmiki, it's supposed, he is supposed to have written uh, his books in Balmiki Nagar, uh, which is quite close to Bhaisalotan or on uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, Nepal border. Then uh, they would have been probably in Sanskrit, in oral translation tradition, pinned down later, then you come to uh, Nepali literature of the classics, uh, um, uh, Bhakt uh, uh, translated uh, Ramayana, uh, then we call of uh, Devkota, is sometimes called Pant Prasad Nirala of Nepali, all three in one, romantic, modernist, uh, and you know, uh, so uh, he, he is uh, termed like that. Those writing in Khaganda is with us, uh, you know, uh, Khagandra Sangraula. So he has uh, developed a style which is so unique. I mean, 
the reason he is not often translated is because it is untranslatable. How do you translate music? You can't translate music. Music is just you listen. So there are some works which you have to learn the language to read, you know, cannot be translated. Uh, then uh, if you talk of Nepali writers writing Nepali literature in English, uh, then Manjushri Thapa is uh, there, Sraddha Ghale has done some uh, good work, Samrat Upadhyaya has done good work, uh, they, they are in Nepali. Uh, uh, what about you... more contemporary writers uh, in Nepal who are not writing in English? Uh, Let's not go back to Bhanu Bhakta, contemporary. You know, uh, writers in Nepal now who are not writing in English. Buddhi Sagar, Karnali Blues just got translated into English by a very good translator, a very competent translator. Uh, another that got translated into English was uh, Narayan Vagle's Palpasa Cafe, which uh, deals with uh, uh, Nepal's Maoist uprising. So a lot of work are being done. Uh, there are younger, in different languages, not just in Nepali language, uh, in different languages of Nepal, work is being done. It's very vibrant. You see, one uh, generic saying about literature is, where there is too much suffering, there will be too much art, and one of them will be too much literature. So a lot of things are being written, uh, and with that, of course, uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, non-fiction too. Uh, so yes, it's a very active field. Thank you very much. And now I think Shayan can talk about the many literatures of Sri Lanka. Um, so, I will start with, I suppose, my journey in the early 80s and 90s. And I think I spoke yesterday about how, you know, now you have a Sri Lankan section in a bookshop, which we didn't before. You had a few scattered books at the bottom shelves. And, um, and I think for Sri Lankan writing in English, uh, that's directly attributable to Michael Undachi setting up the Gratian Prize after um, winning for the English patient. And since then, uh, so now the first... The first book that won the Gratian Prize was Karl Muller's The Jam Fruit Tree. Now, um, now as, a, as a young writer, I remember Undachi, Ramesh Gunasekara was you know, an expat uh, Sri Lankan writer who also achieved a lot of success. Shyam Selvadurai's uh, Funny Boy was quite a groundbreaking book. Uh, but Karl Muller, uh, he was writing not about the war or class, or the, you know, the go-to uh, topics, ethnic conflict. He was writing about the burger community who were... Uh, stereotypically typically, uh, the happy-go-lucky eating, drinking people. And this was just a bawdy saga, this, the, the Burger Trilogy, about uh, this family who got drunk together, fought, uh, had affairs. And, and it was, but the key thing for me was it was written in a very Sri Lankan way of speaking. And for a young writer, that was quite empowering because I couldn't write as elegantly as Undachi or Gunasekara, but I could certainly write like a drunken uncle. And that's what I, I used with, um, with, with the first book. So I see him as a quite, a, I don't know if he's read widely outside of Sri Lanka where he's, he's revered and rightly so. But I see that tradition. And so now if you, if you track that, I'm, I'm sticking to English for now, but if you track that to, to today, uh, you have, um, writers like uh, Naomi Munavira, Anuk Aruk Pragasam, uh, who are writing, again, in that Gunasekara tradition, they are also expat writers who write, uh, you know, beautiful and sad uh, literary novels. But locally, I think the Karl Muller tradition also survives that you have these kind of light comedies from Ashok Ferry and, um, and Andrew Fidel Fernando, who's a travel and sports writer, who has that, that element of irreverence and humor and also using how we speak. But also, I think, Exciting things are happening in science fiction. So there's a young uh, bunch of writers who sidestep the whole publishing industry and they like almost uh, go straight to Amazon, Yudanje Vijayaratna, Amanda Jayathis, uh, Naveen Viraratna, who are writing zombie apocalypse novels set in uh, a dystopian Sri Lanka. And not as widely celebrated, but quite widely read among the young. And this also is a different satirical view of where Sri Lanka is heading. But I think some of the most exciting stuff is happening in theatre. Um, and this is in Singhala uh, theatre especially. And, 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 in, and in English where I feel there's a lot more experimentation, tackling a lot more contemporary topics, uh, a lot more controversial topics, uh, you know, about uh, gender rights, about, uh, yeah, about past conflicts and so on. So that's, I mean, that's just a very general view of the, the different kind of writings there. And, and, uh, uh, a lot of, there's a poetry tra tradition as well. Vivi Marie Van der Putten, uh, I think, writes about you know, feminist issues. And, um, and so, look, we can 
I can keep sprouting names, but I think yes, I what, what is lacking for me, the piece of the puzzle is um, writing in Tamil. You know, Jaffna was, I mean, we were talking before, was such a center of learning and culture. And yet, 12 years from the war, you know, I've been waiting to see more, more stories come out. Mostly, I mean, Shob Shakti, who I mentioned, a child soldier who is now domiciled in France, writing now, looking through that lens of, of uh, looking back at the war. And this is very few and far between. And I, and I wonder, and you look at the publishing industry. Again, this, the silo, there, there's a singular publishing industry and, and English publishers, and they have access to the, the resources of India and so on. But I feel that is the missing piece of the puzzle, that uh, we were not having enough stories coming out of uh, the North and East that were most affected by the war. Mm -hmm. But of course, the war is not the only topic here. There are, there are plenty of things since uh, to write about. Uh, but, so I think a lot more Sri Lankans are writing, and I feel that we, we got permission also, and this is going back to South Asia. I, mean, we were all, I remember as a child reading R.K. Narayan and being just so, Astonished that wow, there is a writer who is as funny and as insightful as P.G. P.G. Wardhouse and as prolific and and reading that and then of course we all know what Midnight's Children and God of Small Things did to us. Uh, there's, I mean, if I can do the inelegant thing of quoting myself, um, there's a part in Chinaman where W.G. watches Siddharth Vittamuni, the great Sri Lankan batsman uh, of the 80s, um, score a century, and he says for the first time, I I saw that a Sri Lankan could be as good as anyone else. And this is how I felt as a young person reading the literatures from India and from Pakistan, reading Mohsin, Hanif, and Kamila. The idea that, yes, uh, South Asians can write as well, if not better, than anyone else. And, and we don't, and maybe this idea, and I suppose we can explore this, who we're writing for. And there was the whole post-colonial argument and Salman Rushdie's famous, uh, um, right, the empire writes back, that we are writing. And this phrase that, um, this Dalit poet, uh, Chandra Mohan, uh, mentioned at a lit fest, which has always stayed with me. It was, Algerians write in French to tell the French that they are not French. And there was this, uh, uh, I mean, it's a lovely phrase, and I, I just think, okay, we were writing in English to tell the English that we are, we are South Asian. But now I wonder if that is even, that is dated as well, whether we, we are now writing for ourselves and writing for each other's stories, because we can see, I can see in the conflicts in Nepal, the conflicts in Sri Lanka, I can see uh, in the stories from Bangladesh, stories from my, my part of the world. And so maybe we are writing for each other and that maybe that's part of, there's a South Asian readership as well as South Asian Perfect. writers. That's, that's what I wanted to come to, the readership of South Asia. And um, my, um, I have a question for Akshay because he's written this wonderful book on Agay, who's not only an important writer, but a very important critic as well. So I now have a question. Um, I think this question would probably go to Sikhil Alji also. What is the role of literary critics and scholars in broadening the context of reading? So we can't keep blaming youngsters for uh, being on Instagram and uh, you know, we can't keep blaming people for not reading books. I think teachers in universities and colleges, scholars and critics have a huge role to play in broadening the context of reading. So what role do you think critics have played or can play in future? Uh, they, they play a very, very critical role. Critics play a critical role. And if we see actually one of the, uh, you know, I was telling you last night, uh, in the 50s, late 50s, early 60s, uh, someone like Agge, since you mentioned him, he started, he had this vision of uh, having, as uh, Shahan was saying, different voices of South Asia. There's no one single voice. Uh, yeah, and the name of the magazine he started called VAK, V-A-K. And funnily enough, V stood for Vatsai in his own name, A for Mulk Rajanand and K for Humayu Kabir. Uh, and he, he uh, you could read poems, early poems of A.K. Ramanujan. You could read George Kate, uh, was a great Sri Lankan painter and poet. And, and a whole lot of things. Unfortunately, as was the case with Agge, none of his ventures lasted long. None of his relationships lasted long, none of his ventures lasted long. So it was the three old, you know, the three issues of work came out. But it made a very, very strong presence and it, kept, it keeps getting talked about even now as a South Asian thing. Much later, I think sometime in the 80s, uh, a film journal was started from Delhi by Aruna Vasudev, which was a big film journal talking about South Asian cinema. And, and it made a mark, it was very well brought out, but then we know the lives of the journals because if you don't have proper backup, 
that too uh, couldn't, yeah, it fizzled out. And I remember the time that the journal was alive, I, I saw some of the best Malaysian, Indonesian, Sri Lankan films in Delhi because they will also tie up and have this little film source. And that completely, that Delhi of the 90s, late 80s, you know, evaporated with that magazine. The magazine ended, that ended. So that conversation, there has been a tradition of the such conversations in the past. We are no longer doing that. And we should ask, actually, country like India, uh, we don't, we, we have so many authors, you know, Indians are writing like never before, fiction, non-fiction. We have just two literary, uh, you know, two book review journals of consequence, a country of India's size. I don't know what's happening in Sri Lanka or other countries. And, and for some reason, uh, these review journals never survive. What? Yeah, the two, uh, one is Biblio, the other is called the Book Review. They have very, very limited circulation, barely thousand copies sell, and it's like in an echo chamber, your book gets reviewed there, my book gets reviewed there, we talk to each other and that's it. Newspapers are no longer, except for one or two newspapers, don't have large, even good film section where serious reviews coming or book reviews even. So, uh, the, there's a whole problem which is happening and you're right that the um, the quality of criticism, the, the length to which we go uh, talking about uh, good literature uh, in South Asia is not happening. You really, when Sehan's book gets Booker Prize, uh, now suddenly everyone in India is celebrating as he's one of our own, you know. But uh, otherwise, as he was telling us, that book had a, not an easy life to begin with, you know. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a huge problem which is, um, and therefore it's not reaching out to young, young generation, even to our generation. We, we have uh, someone who is very invested or keeps going to bookstores or keep reading about books, you'll get to know about few books, otherwise you don't, you know, yeah. yeah thank you very much. The reading culture and um, um, Akshay has mentioned two book review journals, they're both in English. So I think we're coming back to the reading cultures. What are the literary critics in Nepali doing? What are the literary critics in Punjabi doing? What are the literary critics in Tamil doing? What are the literary critics in Sinhala doing? What is their role? And are they, are, they, uh, are they carrying on something which is very important now, a cosmopolitanism, without which I think literary criticism is just uh, very vulgar nationalism. Without a cosmopolitanism, literary criticism does more harm than literature does. So what are the Nepali critics doing? What are the Hindi critics doing? What are the Sinhala critics doing? Perhaps we could think a little about that and hear from each other. Yeah, I just want to make one small, I'll, I'll tell you about this when you said uh, about Hindi and Punjabi and what is happening. Uh, one of the comments that I got from a lot of these, and there are a lot of Hindi, you know it, uh, Hindi literary magazines and many of them got back to me saying that we'll not review it even if it's about a Hindi writer because the book is in English. I don't even understand uh, why something like this will happen. Whereas when Gita Press book had come, it did get reviewed by one Hindi journal uh, which is again uh, read by a small section of people. So these boundaries also need to break. And even uh, in the process, I'm also saying Gitanjali Sri gets reviewed in English papers only when she gets a book or it gets translated. Nobody noticed Deji Rockwell. And Deji has, uh, you know, translated so many uh, books, right, from Upanath Ask to everyone. Uh, so this needs these language barriers, this, and these are artificial ones, you know. And we assume that Hindi writer will, uh, reader will not read English. So th this needs to kind of go. Absolutely, yeah. these are artificial barriers and that's what we're trying to do now, break them. So, Sikhi Ralju, what is the, what is, what are Nepali critics doing? What is criticism in Nepal like? What are English critics in Nepal doing? Ah, you see, uh, critique, neither writers want them, nor readers want them. <laughs> it's such a thankless job. Have a round of applause for this. <laughs> having having uh, done book reviews for almost a decade in 1990s, uh, what I realized is if you have uh, non-fiction, to review that, uh, you really have to work hard, go into the subject, and then review it. So it's a kind of a production of knowledge by itself. Uh, getting the gist of a book in about 100, 
1,200 piece uh, is quite difficult. And no matter how hard you try, the author will always complain that his or her main point has been lost. <laughs> and then when you come to literary work, it is about emotions. It's almost impossible to get into the emotion of a writer or a poet uh, or a literary essayist and then review it. And then you get complaint from uh, uh, readers, you know, that uh, this has not uh, guided us enough. Mm, I used to write regularly for, there used to be a Kathmandu Post review of books. Uh, that was a uh, monthly supplement with Kathmandu Post newspaper. The newspaper later realized that uh, this was reducing, perhaps reducing their uh, appeal to possible advertisers and they discontinued it. Uh, uh, when you talk of uh, Nepali uh, critics, uh, I mean, there are many, uh, everyone is a critic, uh, if you are just criticizing. So there are quite a few. But uh, not many of, say, for example, Nambar Singh, then uh, uh, Manager Pandey. Uh, I don't see that level of uh, critique being done in Nepali, where the critique itself, review itself, is a form of literature. That I don't see that often. But uh, of course, there are some elite kind of a, uh, yeah, yeah, some elite kind of uh, um, uh, journals uh, uh, that are doing it. Uh, Hari Adhikari does sometimes, he likes to trash, uh, you know, uh, the authors he, that he doesn't like and then, uh, uh, you know, elevate uh, to the skies that authors that he likes. There are quite a few, but, but once again, naming names will be, having done that myself for almost a decade, I'll I'll just say that uh, uh, this activity is not very satisfying. Mm, I remember Pradeep Giri just passed away. He was a thinker, a writer, and a politician. He told me that, uh, you know, it's, uh, why don't you become a critic? And uh, I said, uh, if only I had uh, uh, the patience like uh, Khagendra Sangraula or Pradeep Giri to take all that brick bats. What I get is quite enough for me, so I don't want to get into it. And um, talking of uh, uh, the South Asian sensibility, I wanted to interrupt. I remember Romesh Gunsekara coming to Kathmandu in 1994, and I had a similar conversation with him about two of his books, Monkfish Moon and the Reef. Yeah, those two books were there. And what struck me was, in Monkfish Moon, uh, he describes in detail the way of cooking fish. And later I read Sraddha Ghale's book, and she describes the ways of, uh, you know, uh, cooking pork. So probably different kind of cooking food is uh, give this uh, the dosa or the chole bhature, uh, mughlai. Uh, probably that will help in creating some kind of a South Asian sensibility, which will have very less critics. You know, everyone will enjoy that. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, I think Shayan already talked about eating dal, so I think we can go back to cooking dal yeah. because that's what happens in the great Indian kitchens and the great Sri Lankan kitchens and the great kitchens everywhere, which are run by women. So we'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, yeah, the food uh, descriptions in Reef and Monkfish Moon were quite, yeah, I, I remember those, those stuck out for me. And um, yeah, so maybe that, that is a commonality as well. Uh, but Ramesh Gunasekhar, I, I, I'll be, I have to mention Noontide Toll, his, uh, so Monkfish Moon was his first collection of short stories. Noontide Toll came out right after the war. Uh, that for me is my favorite Sri Lankan book. It was written just after the war ended as a collection of short stories about a van driver driving around Sri Lanka. And for me, that's, and I don't think we've had a, as good a post war, and it was so soon afterwards. But yeah, sorry. So, uh, actually, Shayan, I, since you work with advertising, and um, Akshay uh, talked about films, and I think we can now move from uh, written literature, especially prose and poetry, to the new, to the, to new media and new forms. And uh, maybe, maybe ask ourselves if literature and literary critics are not doing their job. Is Netflix doing it? Is Netflix bringing people together? I don't, I don't know how many people have read or bothered to read Vikram Chandra, but people have watched sacred games here, there and everywhere. So uh, is, are, is new media going to 
perhaps contribute in a positive way here. Films, songs, ad ads, uh, some uh, visual ads and print ads can be good literature, serious literature. Can songs and jingles and radio acts and, and Netflix and what have you, uh, by the time I complete my sentence, a new form would have come up. So uh, are they going to fill in uh, more and more podcasts, for example? I think podcasts are doing what literary critics have failed to do. Kindly, um, uh, excuse me for saying this, bear with me for saying this, but I think young men and women across the globe, diaspora, in diaspora or in India, in Sri Lanka, in Pakistan, are doing what critics have, our literary critics, our great veteran critics have failed to do. Podcasts, bringing people together through, um, or through audio programs. So maybe uh, we can think a little bit on this. What our magazines, what a gaze magazine could not do, what book review journals could not do, what great critics could not do, perhaps podcasts, young scholars, academicians. After all, the Negritude movement was started by young men and women, it, you know, uh, and, and they changed the game. So, okay, so we could talk about the new media since you're associated with it also? No, sure. I think, so like you pointed out, the role of the literary critic who we see writing for uh, a prestigious magazine. I think that role is being now eroded by book talk, uh, book tube, good reads. Um, and so you look at, I mean, just following the booker journey, I mean, we couldn't get books to Sri Lanka because of the, it's not an essential service, you know, gas and petrol are more important. And I, so I followed the other books through these, and I, these, these book talkers. Uh, booktubers are hugely influential and uh, and a comment and even on Goodreads there are a certain I don't know if they call themselves critics they have probably have a fancy word for themselves but they are essentially serving that function of being a reader and giving you know quite nuanced uh, critical analysis of work and and this seems to be far more influential uh, than I'm, I think the traditional and in Sri Lanka look it's a very small pond right so um, the critics know the readers, the, the, the writers, the writers know the critics, and so there is an element of politeness, except when there's not, yeah. When there's a proper literary feud, there are a few angry people writing, but mainly if everyone's sort of polite, so I don't know if readers go to stuff in the new, book reviews in the newspaper is led by that. I think it's still, these mediums are more like a word of mouth, really. They, they, they are functioning like that. It's like a reader telling you they're not, they're not friends with the writer, they're not paid by any sponsor, they're doing it as a pure love of reader. So I think these are certainly more powerful in replacing the critic, or, or just the, that's the critic's new evolution, I suppose. Um, but um, with advertising, with cinema, now that's something I've noticed how we look to India. So Sri Lankan cinema, it still, I feel, has a long way to go. We have a few gems here and there, but uh, Certainly in advertising, the language you use, the certain the characters we use, it, it, it leans heavily on the, the behemoth that is, that is Bollywood and that is Indian advertising. Um, but I, I don't know the influence of, of advertising so much because I think the young are much more skeptical of it and much more suspicious of it. And now because it's all this thumb-stopping stuff and you can immediately... Uh, the dialogue is open before we just took what the advertisers told us, whereas now... Um, yeah, the consumers can call out brands and so on. So it's, it's a different relationship. But I certainly feel that readers forming communities on the internet is, is the major... It's, now, publishers are cottoning on to the fact that it's a marketing tool and not many of them are very savvy at it. But I think that'll evolve. And I think this, this will start... You'll start books finding their audiences through these means. Thank you very much for this. I, uh, since we don't really... Okay, since we don't have much time... Um, I'm going to read out some names uh, for you. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a small task for you to tell me what are the two things to think about. You can't tell me. I'll tell you. But to think about uh, what, are the, what are the two important take-homes from these names. Rabia Balki, Rabia Basri, Bibi Lal, Mai Nuri, Mai Bhambi, Anar, Shamia Reza, Yog Maya Neopane, Anir Mal, Abba Khatun, Lal Der, Sajobai, Akka Mahadevi. These are all women mystic poets from South Asia. From Afghanistan to Maldives, these are women poets from, mystic women poets from South Asia. So while religion keeps dividing and tormenting us, it's love and spirituality that binds us together and women who also bind us together. We need to talk about intersectionalities as much as we can. 
So the two take homes from this list are love and women. So very quickly, we'll have to open the uh, uh, house to questions from the audience, but very quickly, so, uh, if our audience could pay attention to what we're talking about on the stage, yeah? You here for a session? So if we could very quickly um, hear from our panelists, it's like a rapid fire round, 30 seconds, or maybe one minute each, uh, to talk about love and women from South Asian literature. Well, firstly, also, we've taken a lot of shots at the critics. I think let's also look at the academics as well. Um, I think as gatekeepers, uncovering these uh, voices from, and the, from literatures in other languages, I think they form the gatekeeper role. And perhaps academe, because when I, for this session, I asked the writers, they didn't have a clue other than what they were doing. It's the academics who were telling me you should check out this, this, this singular writer, this Tamil poet, and so on. So I feel them being hand in hand with um, publishers, that could be something. But anyway, to your, your rapid fire thing, uh, women, Kanya, women. Uh, Kanya Almeida. Kanya the Almeida won the Commonwealth Short Story Prize, and she writes about um, um, domestic work workers, uh, rape survivors, and I think she's, she's a voice to watch for. Uh, another one, Ruanti Tichikera, accomplished playwright, um, wrote the film Machang, which I, for my money is the best Sri Lankan film made. Um, and she's also, again, writing about fractured communities. So those are my two. Yeah. Sikit Alju. Uh, these two questions are related. If medium is the message, in oral tradition, when storytelling was the oral was the medium, Male was dominant. Then you, you came to writing, which was once again who got uh, 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 the kind of opportunity to study. It was again male, so male dominant. Of course, there were female also. From there, it changed to radio, the commanding voice. Once again, male dominant. Then came TV. And then you have this television literature, Netflix or whatever, uh, you know, uh, uh, you suddenly see that uh, women, women come to their own. And now I see when you talk of new media, probably new forms of expression that emotions remain the same, mediums change. So those emotions will be better expressed through female voices as I see uh, from the, and when you talk of this rapid fire, I think in Nepali when you, I did quite uh, uh, you know, ten great Nep Nepali women uh, name artists. Them, name them. Yeah, so uh, some of them, Baniragiri in poetry, Parizat in writing novel, Maya Chhatri, short stories, Sarda Sarma, non-fiction and uh, uh, poems. So uh, a lot of work happening in Nepali too. Thank you, thank you, sir. Um, yeah, new medium has kind of a new generation, a new way of articulating. And we tend to be very dismissive of this generation, but I have realized they read far more and there are different ways of looking. And, and this is what Sehan was saying, this new medium of criticism, uh, be it blogging or be it podcasts, and all have become very, very powerful. And some of them are doing it very, very seriously. As for coming to the poet, I will go back to say someone like Mahadevi Varma. For me, she remains eternal. Again, we were discussing it last night. She's someone who didn't get much due, uh, except for one big book on her in English, and uh, South Asia should read more of, say, Mahadevi Varma. So I would still kind of. So Akshay will it. give us the next big book, more than 770 pages on Mahadevi Varma. If Agge no, gets I, 770 I, I pages, maybe Mahadevi should get at least 800. Yeah. Watch out for his next book. On Mahadevi Varma. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much. We have maybe some five to seven minutes for uh, questions and answers. I request the audience to please be brief, but engaging and focused in asking questions to this wonderful panel that we have here. Maybe two or three questions, uh, short ones. Is there a mic for the audience? Uh, the gentleman here has a question. Literature be included in post colonial literature? Uh, could you specify who is this question for? Uh, or okay. This post colonial thing is very problematic, that categorization. Uh, is, uh, 
post imperialism post colonial is it post colonial or it is continuation of colonialism uh, what i think is any literature when you talk of nepali literature it's very broad so in nepali some literature is being written which is very imperial very colonial some it, that is being written is written is neo colonial then also some which is post colonial we have all kinds of writing being done so i will not just put it in one category something like you know this uh, very kind of glib to say latin american literature is post colonial who says that that's is it's a reader so how you read even the same text can be read in read in different ways so a lot depends upon also upon reader um and please feel free to ask a question in uh, nepali or hindi if you wish we'll have it translated uh um, good afternoon everyone uh, f- uh from the point of view of south asian writing who is this question for uh this is for anyone and everyone uh the question the question is in the context of south asian writing do you get a sense that there is one country or maybe a couple of countries which are dominant uh in terms of the discourse and narrative or do you disc- do you find that you know uh, there is no dominance or do you see that there is no di- no dialogue at all i mean there are three possibilities so is there a dominant discourse is there a dominant discourse in terms of nationalism or in in the sense of a single country dominating or you know do we have this kind of absolute silence where nobody talks to each other i'll request shehan to take on this question that's a tough one well dominance uh, the obvious thing as in uh, cricket i think we live under the shadow of uh, india and and to a certain extent pakistan and i think um, we in every in every aspect of life in in politics in 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 literature that's where we take our lead from and i think you can't really escape that um i don't think there's silence and i think there's there's plenty of dialogue and plenty of reading of others literature but uh, certainly those those two stand out as the dominant uh, is there another question or i could have a question on this question please feel comfortable to ask a question uh, we could give the mic to the gentleman here the first row uh this question is to akshay mukul you have done a wonderful work on agaya do you know this writer named gs nepali who has contributed a lot to hindi literary canon hmm. and uh, what do you know about him or i mean i i want to tie this question with the idea that gs nepali has remained elusive in Nep- in indian context just because he has a name nepali i mean people think that way here uh, do you want to comment on this thank you uh, uh, gs nepali mane all of us read him in school gopal mujhe gopal singh nepali wahi jo mujhe tod lena banmali kavita so yeah he was but somehow you are right you know when i was writing the book and when i was going through his archives somehow you find there is absolutely no communication or nothing happening and in fact it's not only i have asked many hindi critics namur singh included who unfortunately is no more and there is a complete silence about him about his life someone told me that there is a family of his somewhere uh, who you can talk to but then somehow he fell off the map and he was a very very popular poet uh, so yes i do know of him but there is not much literature about him about gopal singh nepali yeah. thank you for this question actually we come back to what shehan said we almost under the and the question that anurag asked we're almost under the shadow uh, of india yeah um, uh, so know? small thing i wanted to add to what anurag was had asked is you know there is this whole communicate when we talk about whether these languages are talking to each other these countries are talking to each other or not for instance in bangla i know there is a huge diaspora there is a lot of thing happening in the diaspora population not only in india so bangla writers from bangladesh india and one of the most prestigious journal is now coming from london on bangla and everyone who reads bangla talks very high of it this is so the center has shifted from calcutta to dhaka and from dhaka to london 
and, and these are well-to-do, literary-minded people and some very good works are happening. Someone like Dipesh said, you know, getting published in this journal is a big thing. Similarly, like Pankaj Misra once told me how these writers are talking to each other in London, all over, you know, India, Pakistani writers, Sri Lankan writers. So there is a use, a new, another world being created yeah. of connection. But, yeah, but yeah. unfortunately that world is always outside of mother yeah. countries. Yeah. We're talking to each other in New York. We talk to each other in London. We don't talk to each other uh, between Kathmandu and Lucknow. Or between Pokhara and uh, Kanpur maybe. So I think we need to talk more. Uh, on, this, on this note, my time is, our time is up. And uh, as we, uh, C.K. Lalji was, oh, you can clap after 30 seconds. <laughs> C.K. Lalji was talking about uh, food, the cooking of fish and the cooking of pork. And I must tell you a beautiful experience I had uh, about one week before I came here. I was at a theology conference in a seminary um, uh, in uh, Bangalore. And we were talking about the new church and its synodality and what church means. And uh, I concluded my speech by quoting, um, by giving my own translation of um, Lakshmi Prasad Dev Kota's uh, lines, Kun Mandir Ma Jan Yatri. And when I concluded that, my colleague from Bangalore got up and he was so inspired, he immediately uh, narrated a structurally and thematically similar poem in Kannada, a vachana of Basavanna, and translated that. I and all of us were amazed and completely delighted to hear Devkota and Basavana saying the same things. So that's where we come together. Thank you very much. A uh, big round of applause for this distinguished panel. <laughs>